I don't know about you, but I have been enjoying these presentations today. We've been learning a lot of valuable information, hearing from experts in the industry, and getting to find out where things are and where things are going in the wireless space. And we're not done yet. We have one more presentation today that I know a lot of you've been waiting for. We're going to hear from Peter McKenzie, and his presentation is on advanced packet analysis. So without any further delay, let's take a look at what Peter has to share. Hello, my name is Peter McKenzie, and I hope you've been enjoying your first day of WTF 20. Now, WTF is about to bring you a world exclusive, the first ever, and possibly the last, episode of Packets with Peter. Now, let me just leave a pause there for the spontaneous applause and whooping, which is currently going on in homes all around the world right now. Now, I understand the excitement you must be feeling right now. So let me tell you what you can expect over the next 30 minutes. If you're expecting great, in-depth, well thought out technical content, as we got from Chuck's keynote this morning, then you'll probably be disappointed. If you're expecting exceptional video production quality, as we saw in Keith's presentation, then you've probably come to the wrong place. But maybe you're just here for the special effects. Well, in that case, I recommend you catch Dan Jones's session on Thursday morning, 2.55 p.m. EDT, on designing Wi-Fi for Apple. However, if you fancy staring at the protocol analyzer for the next 30 minutes with a guy from the north of England, then you've come to the right place. Now, if packets is not your thing, don't worry, there will be more exceptional technical content tomorrow. So go, pour yourself a glass of wine, and come back tomorrow morning. Okay, for those of you who are still here, thank you for staying. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what we're going to be talking about um, today. When we think about troubleshooting networks, we're generally talking about troubleshooting problems between a client and an access point. And there's often two types of issues that occur when troubleshooting problems between client and access points. One is a problem where the client's experiencing poor performance on the network. But another common one is when the client is just saying they can't connect. They're having connectivity issues. And that's the one we're going to concentrate on today. So the client just saying, I can't connect to the network. Why is that? So when we think about a client's connection to the network, it goes through various stages, doesn't it? The first stage it goes through is what we call 802.11 authentication. Then it's going to go through something called association, which is basically association is just like getting connected to the AP. It's like having a link light with Ethernet. And once you're associated to an AP, you then may go through some further authentication, maybe like WPA2 authentication using 802.1xEAP, or maybe authenticating using a pre-shared key. Um, following that authentication, the client then needs to get an IP address using DHCP. And then to be able to get internet access, they need to also ensure they can get access to a DNS server. And client connectivity problems can occur in any of these stages. And we're going to look through this authentication um, in a protocol analyzer during this session. But as well as just looking at these frames, what you'll often find is when you capture a client's association, there's lots of other frames which we often don't talk about, which are happening at the same time. And we want to talk about some of those frames this morning as well. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to open up a protocol analyzer and we're going to look at basically um, a few trace files and we're just going to look through the packets that we have in there. 
It's not going to be very scripted. We're just going to look at the friends we've got and try and explain what it is we see. Now, I'm going to be showing you all these trace files in a protocol analyzer called OmniPeak. If you've seen any of my sessions today, it's my favorite. You'll notice any of my other sessions, you'll notice that it's my favorite analyzer. It's the one I often use. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, OK. First trace file we're going to look at is a trace file where a client success connection is successful. We're going to understand what a successful connection looks like before we start looking at problematic so connections. So let's start off by looking at this trace file. We can see here that the first thing, the first packet we see is an authentication frame coming from an iPhone to an access point. This is an iPhone going through an PEEP EAP exchange with a access point. And we see two authentication frames. Um, and if we look into the first authentication frame, we will see that this is coming from the iPhone to the access point, and it's using an authentication algorithm called open system authentication. In the original standard, there was two authentication methods. One was shared key, which was um, used with the old WEP security solution which was very early on proved to be unsecure, so we don't use WAP. And the other one was called Open System, which was basically no authentication. It should always be successful and always work. But so we see the client requesting Open System authentication. And as I said, it should always work. So when we look at the response coming back from the access point to the client, we will see that it is successful. Open System authentication should always be successful. Following open system authentication, we'll see an association request frame. This is coming from the iPhone to the access point. Inside an association request frame, the client is basically going to say, hey, can I connect to you? I'm trying to connect to this SSID. In this case, it's called Lab Eep. And then it's going to say, these are all my credentials. Hey, I'm a client. I want to connect to Lab Eep. I support OFDM data rates up to 54 megabits per second. These are the channels I support. These are my security requirements I support. These are my high throughput capabilities. I support one spatial stream with MCS's zero to seven and so on and so on. We get all the capabilities, the very high throughput capabilities of what, again, what spatial streams it supports. And it goes on and on. So the client's basically said, hey, can I connect you? These are, all my, these are all my capabilities as a client. What the access point will then do is it will compare the client's capabilities with its minimum set of requirements. What do all clients have to support as a minimum? And hopefully what we want to see is we want to see an association response come back from the AP, which is successful. The status code here is successful. And the access point will also give that client an association ID, a unique identifier. Now, in this case, it's one because it's the first client connecting to this AP. Once we get associated, um, we're then going to, because we're doing um, 802.1x, we're then going to go through an EAP exchange and we can see all these EAP packets. And that's normally when people look at associations where we would jump first, we'd jump back to its first EAP request. But just wait a minute, there's a packet between the association response and its EAP request. There's an action frame. So what's this action frame? Let's have a look at it. Um, and we'll see as we look at this action frame, it's something, it's of the category block acknowledgement, and it's a add. BA request frame and add block app requests. Um, this frame is coming from the AP to the client and it is saying, can I agree a block app policy with you? I want to do immediate block acts. More importantly, what it's saying is saying, can I agree with you iPhone that if I send data are you able to use block acts in response? Can I agree that you can send block acts in response to my data? That's what the 
AP's X skin. And at, we're just going to ignore the EP requests at the moment. We'll come back to the EP packets. But below that, there's another action frame. And this one's now coming from the client to the AP. And it is called an add block act response. And we can see the status code of successful. It is saying, yes, I can agree to have that policy with you. I'll agree an immediate block act policy saying that when you send me data, I've agreed that I'm able to send block acts in response to the data you send. Then a funny thing happens, and you'll always see this, following this add block act request, the access point then basically says, great, I've agreed that with you. I just want to see if you are lying to me. I'm not sure I trust you, so I'm just going to test it out. And it sends a block act request. Um, where it's basically saying, okay, send me a block act. Now, it's not sent any data to the client yet. We'll see the certain sequence number is one, but it's not sent sequence number one yet to the client. So it's saying, block act requests, how much data have you acknowledged from me? And because the clients agree to send block acts, it responds with a block acknowledgement. This is what this BA packet is. It is a block acknowledgement and it comes back and it goes, OK, block acknowledgement um, starting at sequence number one. And I'm missing frames one, two, three, four, all these sequence numbers because basically I haven't received any data. So I might send you a block act, but you've not sent me any data yet. But here we go. So it's just a little test. It was the AP testing that the client can do what it's agreed. Following that, you see another action frame. This time it's coming from the iPhone to the access point. Let's have a look at it. And we'll see it's another add block act request, but not from the AP to the client. It's now from the client to the AP saying, OK, can I agree a block act policy with you? If I send you data, are you able to send block acts back to me? So now it's trying, the client's trying to agree to do block acts the other direction. And we get an action frame back in response from the AP and it says success. Yes, I've agreed to an immediate block act policy. And then we've got another part of the EP exchange. We're going to come back to that. But the client, again, just like doesn't trust the AP necessarily, it wants to test it out and start the first assault. So it sends a block act request and it says, I know I've not sent you any data, but can you send me a block act? And the AP responds with a block acknowledgement. Here we go, starting sequence number one. I haven't received any data yet, so it says all my frames are missing, but we've agreed a block act policy. So it's now agreed that they can both send block acts and they've tried it out and it all seems to be working. And that little block act conversation was going on at the same time it was starting its EAP request. And it's a bit jumbled up with it, but we can start negotiating block act policies from the moment we've associated. We don't need to wait till the client has gone through EAP authentication to do that. OK, let's take a quick look at the EAP authentication then. And it starts off with an EAP request packet, which is basically um, we will see it says it's a request and it's a request for type identity. And it's basically saying, who are you? This is the access point saying, who are you? What's your username? And then we get this EAP response. Now, EAP requests always go from the AP to the client and, and EAP responses come from the client to the AP. So requests, AP to client, responses, client to AP. Um, and what happens in this response? It says, this is a response to the question of identity, who are you? And he says, I am user one. Now what's gonna happen at this point? At this point, the AP is gonna take that request, that EAP request or EAP response saying, hey, user one, and it's gonna forward it onto a radiate server. And the radiate server is going to basically, it's basically saying, hey, can user one connect? And the radio server, if user, 
is then going to respond and send something in response. And at the, from this point on, the access point is just a man in the middle. It's going to forward e packets between the client and the radiant server. It doesn't get involved in it. It's just sending messages between the two. So the first e request comes back from the radiant server. And it basically says, um, this is a request to do EAP TLS. Can, can I start? Can, let's do EAP TLS. And my client comes back and goes NAC, a non acknowledgement or a negative acknowledgement, basically, no. It's gone. EAP TLS and client's gone, ah, uh, no. Okay, what comes next? Well, the Reddit server comes back again and it goes, oh, okay, you don't do EPTLS, what about EPEEP? Let's, let, let's start EPEEP, this is an EPEEP start message. And the client comes back with a response and we get a PEEP start. It basically says, yay, now you're talking my language, I can do EPEEP, let's do that. And it sends the client hello message. And inside this client hello is a list of all the cypher trees that can respond because peep is a tunnel D type. It's going to establish a tunneled, an encrypted tunnel to do the actual proper username and password deep exchange. And it's basically, so these are all my options for doing that. And the next EAP request comes back from the client. Um, it's basically coming back and going, okay, great. Let's start doing that. And inside, it's a little bit hard to see, but inside this packet, it's quite a big packet. It's actually got, you'll see there's some information here, which is actually the digital certificate of the radio server being sent back to the client. And that's why this is quite a large frame. Now, I'm not going to explain the rest of the EAP protocol exchange now because they establish an encrypted tunnel and then it all becomes encrypted. But after within the encrypted tunnel, they exchange credentials for that client and authenticate their client. And providing it's been successful, you get one of these EAP success messages come back saying, okay, you've successfully connected. Um, then we get something called a four-way key exchange, which occurs, which is just where the um, client and the AP exchange security keys so they can then encrypt data. What else do we see down here in this trace file? Well, following that, we see two more action frames. Okay, I wonder what these ones are. Um, and you might be surprised by these. But we've got another ad block act request. This is coming from the AP to the client, and it's saying, hey, if I send you data frames, can you send block act in response? Well, we've already seen it's negotiated this, and it was all working. So why is it doing it again? Well, some chipsets just have odd behaviors like this. There's nothing particularly wrong with it, but it's a little bit unnecessary. But we see things like it, and the client comes back and goes, yeah, I might have told you this once, but yeah, just as in last time, I'll agree to doing this. We can do it. And then here we go. Um, there's also some other interesting frames here. Um, there's this frame here. Um, it gets actually sent twice, but let, let's talk about what it is. It's a control frame called a very high throughput slash HE NDP announcement frame, null data packet announcement. It's the AP sent that, hey, I'm about to send you a null data packet, which is just basically like a physical layer header. We can't actually capture those in our protocol analyzers because it's not on that frame. And within that, there's going to be a long training field for each spatial stream, the AP supports. And it's basically, hey, I'm about to send you one of these frames, and I want you to tell me how you hear it. Um, it does this. We call it channel sounding. And it uses it in things like multi-user MIMO and transmit beam forming. This is actually a transmit beam forming one because it's what we call a single user one, um, which we can see 
inside here, that's just for one user. You can see it's called single user feedback request. Um, but without getting into a lot of detail, but that's basically what it's saying, it's saying, hey, listen to this frame I'm about to tell, send you, um, and then send me back how you hear it in something called a feedback matrix. And what we see, it'll then, it'll then send that by layer header, which we can capture. Um, the iPhone will listen to it, and then it sends back this action no act frame, which is, which we'll see here, it has its compressed beam form and report. And this is basically, we see the feedback matrix. So it's really big as a feedback matrix, and we don't need to understand it all, but it's basically how the client heard that frame. And what it allows after receiving this frame, the AP can then calculate what we call a steering matrix, and it can then send steering frames to the um, uh, to that client, and it can send, send doing transmit beam forming. So that's what we see. So we'll see that happening every now and again, these sounding exchanges. But pretty much, it can start sending data. And we can see encrypted data here, and then we can see a block at um, block act requests and block acts going on as well. Um, as we start getting data transferred, um, which is good to be able to see as well. So then we've got our encrypted data. So that's how a client, when it's working, successfully connects to a network. Um, Let's have a quick look at some of the other things we can maybe see in this trace file then. We'll see the channel that the client has just associated to is channel 44. A little bit later down in this trace file, we can see... Give me a minute while I just get to the right point in this slide. Um, now, at this point, it changes from an AP on channel 44, which is access point one, to access point two on channel 52. And we see a reassociation request and a reassociation response frame. Now, I want to just show you something the reassociation response frames. Reassociation response frames are very like beacon frames. They tell us all the capabilities of the AP. And if we look in the robust security network information element, we can see that this AP supports two authentication management suites, 802.1x, which is what we've just seen the client do, and then something called ATT authentication negotiated over 802.1x. That's FATS transition, it's 802.11r, FATS secure roaming. Now, in the early days when people implemented 802.11r, you might remember some vendors had an issue with any client that didn't support it, couldn't connect. In, and that was because they implemented it in such a way where they only put FT authentication in their beacons and they didn't have this extra line in, which meant that if you didn't support it, you couldn't connect because you didn't understand what FT authentication was. Um, if it's got both options, it means that if clients don't support FT, well, they can do a full 802.1x. So do watch out for that when looking at um, networks, because that can cause a problem. But this one supports that, and we do see it's using it, because all we see is a reassociation request and response, and then we're connected straight away. No four-way handshake, no 802.1x. Um, in this instance, it's doing what we call FATS BSS transition over the DX it actually starts the authentication process on the old AP. Notice these two action frames to channel 44. Um, the first one is what we will see. It's called a, a FATS BSS transition. And what it's doing, without going into much detail, it's, we'll see, although it's got this target AP address, which is AP2. So the this packet is meant to go to AP2, but it's been sent to AP1. And it's a job of AP1 to forward it over the Ethernet network, over the DX, to AP2, who is the correct destination. And it's starting the authentication process. If you know anything about the thought, it's saying I've got a cached key. Um, 
which means it doesn't need to do the full 802.1x process and it's starting the four-way handshake by sending its nonce. Now, I'm not going to explain the whole four-way handshake this session, but for people who know what it is, you can see that there in the packets. The next action frame actually comes back from the target AP, but via AP1, and it continues to perform that four-way handshake. We can now see an A nonce and an S nonce in there. So we've already started that authentication process by the time we send the reassociation request to the access point. And therefore we can just continue the four-way handshake and the authentication process in the reassociation request. And in the reassociation response frame, we complete that authentication process and complete the four-way handshake. You can see the MIC and the nonces. You can see, for people who know what the GTK is, the group temporal key, you can see that, and it's encrypted in the PTK, which has been negotiated. And what we've effectively done there is in these four frames, we have authenticated to the network and completed our four-way handshake. So it's a very fast row. Perfect. Let's look at some other trace files. And we're going to start up by looking at one where we, we let's see an 802.1x process that doesn't work. And we'll see what's happening. So we're going to start looking at when from this authentication, ignoring the first few packets here. This is a kind of it goes through open system authentication. It does a reassociation request and a reassociation response. And we can see that this reassociation response was successful. So up to this point, everything's gone well. Then we see an EAP request, which is this request for identity. And then we see the client sends an EPOL start. Optionally, a client can go, hey, can I start the EPOL process? It's a l not really needed because the AP's already tried to start it, but the AP goes, okay, okay, let's start now then. Maybe you weren't ready when I send the request. So here's the request again. Give me your identity. Who are you? And we get an EAP response. Hey, here's my identity. I'm user one. And then what do we expect to happen? The AP should send that request onto a Radiant server, and a Radiant server is going to respond and say, hey, can I do TLX or we peep? What happens? Well, the client just sends a response again. Uh, user one, can I connect? So it's not getting a response. And then it waits 23 seconds, which is a long time, and then sends an EPOL start message again. Hey, hey, can I start the EPOL process? I've, I've not received anything back from the Radiant server. And the AP goes, yeah, who are you? What's your identity? And goes like this, user one. But that's as fast as it ever goes. We never get any packet back from the Radiant server. So eventually, the AP de-offs the client. And then it starts again. And we see the pattern repeated. This is a classic case where the Radiant server is not responsive. Maybe the Radiant server has been misconfigured on the AP, or maybe the Radiant server has gone offline. But this is what we see when we're getting no responses back from the Radiant server, and it's not getting any, and we're not getting any responses. So that's a non-responsive Radiant server. Um, so we're going to look at um, another some more connection problems now, which are a little bit more involved. Now, we have issues when we're connecting initially to a network, but we can also have issues when we're roam, because when we roam, we're basically disconnecting from one AP and connecting to another one. And we, yes, we want it to happen fast and in a timely manner. Now, in this trace file, you're going to see is that we're going to look at a roam. And we can see the client's probe requesting out because it's trying to roam from its current AP. That's what these first probe requests and responses are. And then we see it starts to do a roam. And we'll see open system authentication. We'll see a reassociation request and response. And then we see some EAP requests and EAP responses. And in, in, for this example, it's doing EAP TLS. 
So there's a lot more packets that get transferred between in that EAP exchange. But still, eventually, we get an EAP success and we get four key packets and encrypted data. It appears to all be working. However, this wasn't working. Um, the kind was experiencing problems during this row, lots of pin drops. And there's actually two issues. Although when we quickly look at that, it appears to be working, there's actually two issues here. Um, let's have a look at them and see if we can see what they are. Um, the first issue, let's have a look at the reassociation request from the client. First of all, we see in the reassociation request, when we look in the robust security network information element, we can see it's got a cache pairwise master key. Now, the reason the client has a cache pairwise master key is it's saying, hey, I've got this cache key for UAP, so we don't need to go through the full 802.1x. We can go straight to the four-way handshake, and we don't need to do the full um, four-way handshake. It's actually trying to do something called opportunistic key caching, which actually, if we look at other rooms, it will work in fine with other APs. But as we connected to this one, um, we said, hey, we've got a cached key, and we get a response which is successful back, but then we get the a need request from the AP, and it says requests identity. Now, the only reason we're getting that is because the AP is basically saying, I don't have a cached key for you, so give me your identity. Let's do ETH. So the first issue we see here is why doesn't the AP, why is it not received the cache key? for this client? Why is it doing a full EAP exchange? That, that's the first issue that we've got with this trace file um, and, and something that can be looked into. Um, but let's look at the other issue. I'm going to, from this EAP request here, I'm just going to do what's called set it as a relative packet. What that means is if I look at this relative time column, it's going to tell me how long after the first EAP request everything else happens. So let's go down and have a look at this EAP request and EAP response as we scroll down. Um, I'm not going to open up every packet, but I will explain what's happening. It does a request for identity and it responds. And then the radius, and it agrees to do EAP TLS, which is what's happening here. And then we see these big packets, um, 1,054 bytes. And there's a number of them about that size. And this is the radius server sending its digital certificate to the client. Um, it actually happens in a number of packets because it's a really big certificate because it's from the security. Um, and we can see it takes a little bit of time and it's actually taken 1.7 seconds just to get all of that done. Now, some of that delays because it's radiant servers in the US and its client was in the UK. So there was um, a, quite a lot of delay over the connection, but it's still not too bad. 1.7 seconds longer than you'd want, but um, that's taken it. Now, what happens next? So it sent its packet and this EAP response basically says, okay, sorry, not this one, that's the last one. So this EAP response basically says, okay, I've got your certificate, thanks. The next EAP request from the radio server comes back and says, okay, now give me your certificate. Because it's EAP TLS, it's client and server side certificate. Um, so let's take a look at that. EAP request, and then nothing happens. In fact, 6.8 seconds from the beginning of the EAP exchange, it sends another EAP request. Hey, can I have the client side certificate? And the client doesn't respond. And then 11 seconds now after the start of the conversation, another EAP request. Can I have the client side certificate? 16 seconds now. So it's basically five seconds between each of these. It then says EAP request. Can I have the client side certificate? And then another five seconds later, another EAP request from the Reddit server. Can I have the client side certificate? We're now 21.8 seconds since the beginning of that EAP exchange. Now look at each of these EAP requests. 
they get acknowledged by the client. So the client's wirelessly receiving them. It's just not responding with its certificate. And then eventually at 30, you know, after about five, six requests, the client goes, oh, here's my certificate. And it takes four frames to send it in. So 23.9 seconds later, the client sends its certificate. And then we can see eventually the EAP 26.8 seconds later from the beginning of the EAP exchange, we get an EAP success four-way handshake. So yes, it's successful, but it's just taken the client 26.8 seconds to do an EAP exchange. It's got several pings in that time. Why did the client just not respond? Well, let's have a look. That's why looking at sometimes the other packets is useful. Look at between every sort of EAP request and response, there's its very high throughput NDP announcement frames that we've already talked about. The AP is constantly saying to the client, hey, I'm about to send you a null data frame. Will you listen to it and tell me how you get it? Oh, here's a null data frame. Will you listen to it and tell me how you get it? Hey, all the way through this authentication, it's been asked to do something else. And then it gets a really big certificate, which it's got to process. And then it's got to generate its certificate to send. And all the time it's been told, hey, can you do this thing? Is this right behavior? Should it really be doing it this often? And these are the sort of things you've got to look for as to what's causing that client just to lock up and not be able to respond. Let's take a look at some other interesting examples here as well then. We'll probably finish on this one today. So here we have a, another roaming um, issue. And we've got a client who's transmitting data on an AP. Um, and I am going to go down to the point when it decides to roam. which is just here. So it's on an AP and the signal strength is dropping up. So it goes up channel to do some probe requests, probe responses. Let me find another AP to roam to. And then we see it says to do open system authentication with a new AP. And we see an association request and we see an association response. And we see four key packets and encrypted data. It seems like it's roamed quite well. And everything looks okay. However, look at this data. Now in the flags column, do you notice a little plus? That plus tells me that this frame is a retransmission. So although it's connected and roamed APs reasonably successfully. There's a few retransmissions on the OR. It looks like it's having difficulty getting any data through. Nearly every packet is a retransmission. Why is that? What's going on? Well, let's have a look. The association requests from the client, we're seeing at NEG 66. That's because I was capturing quite near the client. We had our protocol analyzer fairly near the client. But look at the association response, neg 88. That's quite a low signal. The next packet we see from the AP, neg 90. There's a neg 88 and neg 90. This client seems to have connected to an AP not very close. Now, when we did a survey, this was in a warehouse. When we did a survey, there was neg 65 dBm everywhere. It was all green. Green is good. Not always. Uh, but it was all green. It was neg 65 everywhere. Why on earth, when we're roaming, was it picking such a bad AP? In fact, when we looked at the access point it was picking, it was actually towards the other end of the warehouse on another floor. What on earth has it picked that AP to roam to? Well, the key here is in the channel number. 
And when we look at this client, it only ever moved to channel numbers in the first four channels, 36, 40, 44, and, 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 and 48. Why did it do that? Well, what we learned was this was a Vocalect picking device and the profile which has been pushed onto it was a profile which only allowed it to go to non-DFS channels. And in the UK, that was the first four channels. That was all it was allowed to use. But the wireless LAN that had been implemented here had been um, given an automatic channel settings where it could use all five gig channels. So the client was now in a place where there wasn't any, all the channels of all the APs near it were all using DFS channels. And the client had been configured not to use any DFS channels. So it was connecting to the best and only non-DFS channel it could find in the area, which was on another floor, halfway across the warehouse and getting per performance. Because the clients have been configured the wrong way and the network another way, they've got we've got to match those two things up. So um, that was another example of a connectivity issue we're getting with um, what wireless networks. Um, that is where we're going to finish for today. I hope you've enjoyed this first instalment of Peter's packets. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much for listening. All right, Peter, what a great presentation to end the day on. Um, first of all, it was a lot of fun starting off, and then it was a lot of great information as we went through it. So thank you very much for that presentation. Um, everybody always likes to see you talk about packets, and I know you like to talk about other things too, but uh, that was a, a very good presentation. So thanks for being with us today. That's okay. Thank you for having me. It's been great yeah. to be here. Absolutely. And uh, very excited about the results we've seen today with the people attending um, and uh, glad that people have had an opportunity here today to get together and chat with some people that maybe they haven't had the chance to chat with for a while due to uh, the lack of conferences. But we have some questions for you that have come in. So Excellent. I want to address those. Some questions. All right. So first of all, um, a question was asked. What do you think about the different packet capturing methods? Uh, you know, RP cap, uh, capturing from APs, capturing in on a MacBook versus on Windows and so forth. So uh, I know you can't go into great detail on every possible scenario, but in general, what are some of your thoughts and ideas around that? Yeah, um, what I would say is I, I use them all. Um, if there's a, a available option to me for capturing packets, I, I, I probably use it. Um, and, I, and I think, um, it very much depends on what you're what you're trying to achieve through a packet capture. Um, so if you you know you're stuck doing remote packet capture where you can't get on site, then using things like AP packet capture and using things like um, our PCAP are great tools of being able to, um, especially during COVID, of being able to get packet captures when you can get on site. Um, they're also really useful um, doing AP packet capture when you're trying to capture things like multi-user MIMO frames and frames which are not so easy to capture from a physical location. Yeah. So um, I, I guess uh, I don't think there is a, one perfect method of capture. Um, I will use often many available to me. So if I go on site to do some vertical analysis, I will nearly always do have a wired capture running so I can look at the wireless packets as they tra traverse the wired networks so that involves setting up a span or using a network tap and then I'm going to do some wireless packet captures as well um, yeah. and, and it might be apt to do some AP captures depending on what I'm trying to get so anything the first thing I do is identify what data do I want to see and then it's what's the best method for getting that data um, so, so they're the questions, I guess. Absolutely. And, you know, and sometimes you want it from multiple locations. Sometimes you want to see what the AP sees and see what the client sees and so forth. So sometimes in, in a single event, you're actually capturing from multiple sources in order to get the full picture. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I've been places where I've told the in some other talks. I won't tell the whole story, but where basically I, because I, the problem basically took the network down that I was troubleshooting, that they gave me one shot of introducing this problem. That especially when it turned on some devices, the network came to a standstill. And they basically said I could introduce a problem for five minutes and no more. So I had to make sure I had wired packet captures, AP packet captures, time captures. So I was going to get one shot to capture the data. And that was it. So in that, that was a case of let's get captures in every location I can, because I, I don't know what, what I need to see at that point. Um, Absolutely. Okay, so our next question, a uh, huge topic it could potentially open up. And so I'll ask you to give me your 60 to 90 second summary. Otherwise, we'll be here till midnight Eastern Standard Time uh, trying to answer it. Uh, the question is, any particular advantage of using OmniPeak over Wireshark? So in a nutshell, how, how do you describe that? Other than, I mean, we've, we've seen a lot in the presentation, which I yeah. think probably answered a lot of that question. But uh, it just in summary, what would you say are some of its advantages? So uh, it's obviously it's a pay to, and, and, and therefore to some extent you, you get what you pay for, but it's, I would say it's ease of use is, is, is the number one, and it's presentation of data is very, very clear. So the fact that it colors the decodes makes it quite easy to follow as opposed to a black and white decode in Wireshark. Um, and my, my number one best feature is the ability to sort of right click and select packets and move them out to another window. For further analysis, um, that, that there would be my top reasons for using OmniP. Absolutely. Okay, and then the final question we have here for today is uh, someone's asking about a network dump where they can see block acts, but there's no block act request for some reason. What do yeah. you think might cause something like that? Yeah, it's a great question, and you will see this a lot actually. So, um, and you're going to see that in response to what's called an aggregated MAC protocol DIRT unit, um, which is a frame which aggregates multiple MAC frames into one big frame. And the correct response to that is a block acknowledgement. Um, you, you can't just send a normal act in response to it because you're acknowledging multiple frames within that aggregated frame, uh, but you don't need to send a block act request if it's an aggregated frame. Um, and ju just to put some context behind that, um, since 802.11ac stated that all frames should be aggregated MAC protocol dirt units. So if you're doing AC um, packet captures, then you're going to see, that's what you're going to see in response to all data frames. You're going to always see a block act. And there's no need to have a, um, a block act request because it's just the acknowledgement in response to receiving an aggregated frame. Absolutely. All right. Great information. And once again, amazing presentation. Always love it. And uh, we look forward to your further presentations later on. And thanks for joining us today. And let me also say thank you to everybody for joining the event today. It's been a wonderful day, a lot of great feedback, and we want to keep giving you more great content tomorrow. So we'll be right back here tomorrow, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to kick off the day tomorrow. Once again, thanks, Peter. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. All right. Take care, everyone.